Our next speaker is uh, a friend of mine, uh, Emily Rice. She's uh, an assistant professor at the College of Staten Island in CUNY. Uh, she's also a research associate at the American Museum of Natural History, a professional astronomer. Um, and she's going to talk to us about how we learn about alien atmospheres. Can I stand on the platform? Where you want. I dressed for a fashion show. <laughs> I'll actually, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my outfit at the end. Um, I have way too many slides. I'm positive. Can everybody online, is everybody online going to get my slides? OK, sweet. Um, I'm not going to use the laser pointer, but I will use my remote control, I hope. So I, is this changing gears a little bit to talk about science? Maybe. <laughs> Honestly, I'm not sure. I've been sleeping instead of uh, hacking like you guys have been. Um, but I'm going to talk about alien atmospheres. But my subtitle is why you should not yet buy extrasolar planet real estate. Um, because I'll give away the punchline at the beginning. We don't know crap about exoplanet atmospheres quite yet. Um, we're getting there. We've got some really awesome techniques. We're getting close. Um, but don't go buying any real estate just yet. Um, so, whoops. You see press release images that look like this. It's very, very enticing. This is like when the real estate agent goes in, cleans everything up, uses a fisheye lens, you know, bright daylight in the apartment. Um, this is not actually what we know about the exoplanets. Sometimes it's very representative and nicely realistic, um, but this one you can see like a surface and a little bit of water and some green and some brown stuff. No, we don't know any of that at all. Um, the data look like... Ugh, the data look like this. This is what we know about this exoplanet in particular. This is straight from the science paper, uh, published last year in the Astrophysical Journal. This happens to be a planet that was detected using the wobble method, or radial velocity measurement. So this is a nice video showing what the wobble method is. This is also a little bit misleading because it looks like the planet is nice and big and visible, but the spectrum at the bottom, that's what we actually measure, is coming from the star. And so what happens is we see the spectral lines of the star shift back and forth, which makes us think that the exoplanet is wobbling. Wobble, wobble, wobble. <laughs> um, and we infer the, the presence of the planet. And because this method is based on the reflex motion, just based on gravity and the orbital motion, the only thing that we actually get for this planet, the thing that we can actually measure, is the mass of the exoplanet, how much stuff it is there. Um, so keep that in mind. This, everything is going to come back together in just a couple more slides. For another method, this is an exoplanet called Kepler-186f. There was a huge press release last year because this is probably the most Earth-like exoplanet that we know about. Um, but the thing about Kepler-186f is that we've actually, uh, we might have measured both, but for the Kepler planets, the Kepler is this big mission that has monitored hundreds of thousands of stars um, in order to see uh, what I like to call now a winking um, from the stars. So it's not a blink because the star doesn't totally disappear, but the star kind of winks a little bit because the planet passes in front of it. So the star's brightness decreases just a tiny little bit. Um, and in this method, because of how it's, uh, you know, what we can actually measure, we can determine the radius of the planet, just the size of the planet, the physical size. And unless you also have wobble measurements, you don't know, necessarily know anything about the mass. And the same thing with the wobble planets, unless you have the planet that also happens to transit, you don't know anything about the radius of the planet. Uh, and just because I like to show the data, here's the, the data in particular for that planet. Um, the background points, the kind of smallest gray points are the actual measurements. The blue, larger blue points are what they've been. And the red line is, is their answer right there. If I took out the red line, I like to think like, you know, would you actually see something there if you took out the red line? Maybe not, but we, we draw these handy red lines through our data to, to make you believe what we want to say about the planets. Um, and I'll also point out that the, the journal there is called Science. The shorter the journal name generally, the more exciting the, res the, um, <laughs> the results. So the previous one was Astrophysical Journal. Science means it's super exciting, just one word journal. Uh, so that's the data for that planet. If you have both of them, if you have a mass and a radius, you then have a mass and a volume. And as you remember from intro chemistry or intro physics, if you have mass and a volume, then you can get a density. And so when you do have both of these measurements, you can get a bulk density for the planet. And so you can figure out overall, is it as dense as iron or rock? Is it this density of rock? Is it rock and water? Is it water? And so the colored lines on this plot show kind of the, um, the tracks that the planet 
planets would fall on if they had those approximate densities or if they had those approximate compositions. And the points on there are the planets for which we have been able to measure both mass and radius. And you'll notice, number one, that there aren't that many. There are thousands of exoplanets that we have some measurement of, enough of a measurement to say they probably exist, but there's only a handful for which we have enough measurements to actually say this is what we think the mass is, this is what we think the, the density and the, the radius are. Um, and again, this comes from a nature paper, so pretty exciting. Um, but, and the error bars are huge. Where there's these planets, and especially the exciting ones are getting down towards the rock and the, and the water, um, but you know, we don't exactly know what the composition is. We can't necessarily very um, conclusively infer a bulk density from these measurements yet. Um, and even bulk density isn't as awesome as you might think. This doesn't still quite get us to Earth. And an example in our solar system is that the bulk density of these planets is very, very similar. The atmospheres of these two planets, their Earth and Venus, just in case you need a, um, a little cheat sheet, is very, very different. The atmospheres of these objects are very, very different. Um, so how do we actually get at the atmospheres of the planets? We can learn a little bit about extrasolar planet atmospheres, um, but unfortunately we can only, the, we can infer the most about exoplanets that aren't quite similar to Earth yet. So we can infer quite a bit about um, planets that are called hot Jupiters, that are large planets cl close into their stars, and we can um, learn a lot about young gas giant planets that are pretty far away from their stars. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about the techniques that we do um, to, to study these types of planets. Um, one of them is actually very similar to the Wink method, but instead of just finding the planet, measuring its size and measuring its orbit as it goes in front of the star, um, we need a really bright star so we can do some more precise measurements. And those two precise measurements are called primary eclipse measurements, the blue circle in the front, and then secondary eclipse measurements, which is the orange circle in the back. And so first I'm going to tell you what we can do with the secondary eclipse measurements. So as you may, may, might be able to guess, as this planet orbits around the star, so this is a hot Jupiter planet that's orbiting really closely. Sometimes the orbits are as small as just a few days. And these planets are tidally locked, which means that it always keeps the same face towards the star. And so that side of the planet that is really facing the star the whole time can get really, really hot. And so as that planet starts to move behind the star, we can actually see that thermal emission, the, just the, the radiation coming from that hot planet, and the brightness of the overall system is going to increase very, very slightly. Um, and if you can make that very, if you can measure that very, very slight increase in brightness, you can kind of back it out to this map of basically a, a surface almost. They call it a surface. Um, it's you know kind of the upper layers of the atmosphere really because this planet doesn't necessarily have a solid surface. But you can map how the heat and the temperature change around the star or around the planet at different longitudes. And the interesting thing about this planet is that the sun facing longitude, so the, the subsolar point on the planet is marked there with the arrow, but the hottest point is actually offset from that a measurable significant offset. This was also um, a, I believe it was a nature paper. It was definitely either nature or science. Um, and so because that hot spot is offset, you can infer very fast winds in the upper atmosphere of this planet. And so that's pretty exciting. Um, but again, this is what the data look like. <laughs> we're going, you know, we're, we're making kind of a lot of leaps from the directly, the actual measured data to kind of how we visualize the exoplanet. Um, and so what the data look like are there's the primary eclipse as the big dip, the secondary eclipse is the smaller dip in the top panel, but what we're actually modeling is a slight increase in brightness between the primary eclipse and the secondary eclipse. And so that's zoomed in in the bottom panel. You can see that the y-axis changes from just about 3% to less than, than 1%, just tenths of a percent, in order to see that increase in brightness. This is just amazing, amazing science that takes a really high precision, really careful analysis of the data from this telescope. Um, the smallest planet that we've been able to infer something about the atmosphere is this planet that's called GJ1214b. It's, some people call it a super Earth, some people call it a sub-Neptune. Um, I think most people now call it a sub-Neptune, so we think it's a, it's a big gaseous planet, but not as big as Jupiter or Saturn. Um, this is also a planet for which we've been able to do transit measurements. And for this planet in particular, what we've done is used the primary eclipse measurements and taken those measurements at different wavelengths. 
because this is uh, orbiting a, a bright enough star that we can make these uh, transit measurements in a lot of different wavelengths. And so here's what we've been able to infer about, again, the bulk composition and perhaps even the atmosphere of the planet. And here is what the data look like. So all of those gray and, and black data points are measurements of the transit depth at different wavelengths, which we can then match up to models, which are the colored lines on here, uh, to try to match up the model of the atmosphere with the data. And basically the bottom line for this planet is that nothing works yet. And we don't fully know why. Um, and so that's a, a, lot of, uh, an ex a planet that a lot of people are, are still studying and are very excited about. Um, and last but not least, which maybe you've already thought of it, in order to study an, uh, an exoplanet atmosphere, why don't we just look at the planet itself? Um, and we can now for several systems. So actually looking at the planet itself is, is also very, very difficult because the stars are so much brighter than the planets. You need hardware and or software in order to block out or remove the light from the star in order to actually see the light from the planets. And this was the first um, multiple planet system that was directly detected. So the, the mess of colors in there with no letter on it is where the star was removed, where the light from the star was removed. And then the planets B, C, D and E are the planets that have been imaged multiple times, and so the arrows represent their um, predicted orbital motion as they orbit around the star. And so this is really, really exciting, but these are not Earth-like planets. These are very massive planets, five to 10 times the mass of Jupiter, and they're also very far away from their host star. Um, you can see 20 AU is the scale at the bottom there, and so 20 AU is uh, about the distance of um, Uranus away from the sun, for example. And so this is a kind of a supersized solar system for which we can only see the outer giant planets, gas giant planets. Um, there's an increasing number of these. The one that I la just showed, HR8799, is kind of the most exciting one because it's one of the only multiple planet systems. But there's an increasing number of these systems for which there's directly observed planets, which is exciting. Sometimes we can see a disk around them, like for Beta Pictoris and for Fomalhaut, um, th so the Beta Pictoris is actually the star, the planet is represented by the lowercase letter. Uh, Fomalhaut may or may not actually be a planet, it might be some kind of dust cloud that's orbiting the star, that's also very exciting. Um, Kappa Andromeda, I gave it an uppercase letter B because we actually think based on its mass that it might not be low enough mass to be considered a planet, but that's kind of um, very open for debate right now. And then one RSX blah 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 is also another, it's a, it's a young um, planet and a young star system. Most of these are pretty young, but that one's one of the youngest. Um, but, you know, for, so for these exoplanets, we're always limited in the data that we can get. And one of the ways that we can try to understand more about these atmospheres is use these other objects that happen to be the things that I study. So I like to sell them as directly imaged exoplanet analogs, and they're called brown dwarfs. They're things that form like stars do, but they don't form with enough mass to ignite hydrogen and fuse it into helium. They just cool and fade with time. And they can have really low mass. We think they can form out there on their own down to five or 10 Jupiter masses. And so that's technically in the planetary mass regime. Um, but these things are out there floating on their own. They're not around a host star. And so we can, you know, we don't have to remove the light from a star. We can study these objects in a lot more detail currently with current technology than we can study the planets that are around other stars. And there's also a lot more of these that we know about. And so here's just a, a ton of them. Um, and we can use these to improve our atmosphere models, to make predictions about how we should best observe the exoplanets. Um, basically, brown dwarfs are our, um, our, our gateway towards understanding atmospheres of other planets. Um, and in fact, we can make you know, the same press release images that represent what we think are uh, constituents of the atmosphere, what clouds form at different layers and at different temperatures around these objects. And you can see that it's a nice kind of continuum between an exoplanet atmosphere, a brown dwarf atmosphere, and a Jupiter atmosphere. Kind of similar compositions of clouds at similar temperature layers, similar, similar pressure layers. Um, and again, for the brown dwarfs, we can make a lot more detailed observations. Uh, last but not least, we already have improved instrumentation coming down the pipeline to be able to study exoplanet atmospheres in new and exciting ways. The James Webb Space Telescope is gonna launch in 2018. Hopefully everybody knows about that. That's nice that NASA's kind of next 
flagship space mission, but there's also more recently approved the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. It's a little bit smaller, a little bit um, uh, lower scope, but it's going to be specifically targeted at studying, um, I think, something like half a million exoplanets. Monitoring, monitor, sorry, stars. Monitoring about half a million stars, looking for those transits, and it'll be able to do it um, with enough precision to, to do some of those atmosphere tricks in order to measure the, the um, atmospheres of these exoplanets, which Kepler, unfortunately, couldn't, isn't really capable of doing, wasn't really capable of doing. Um, so as a takeaway message, before you buy real estate, so here's a, a press release image that puts together all of the most uh, current, possibly habitable exoplanets. Um, buyer beware, because not all of these are even necessarily confirmed exoplanets, and we definitely don't know very much about their atmospheres quite yet. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Um, you can find me on Twitter. I have more coming because I also do Star Toyalist, hence my dress. This is the Orion Nebula. Um, that's on Twitter and on Tumblr. And then I run Astronomy on Tap events in New York City and coordinate some of these events around the world. Um, they're hosted at, uh, in New York City by this woman named DJ Carly Sagan, who looks a lot like me, but I've never actually met her in person. Um, and then last but not least, my research field of brown dwarfs has a mascot who's also on Twitter and happens to have a music video if you want to check that out. Okay, thank you, and I'll take questions. Hi, Emily. Um, just a quick question. So I always wondered about the naming conventions for these oh, exoplanets. Yeah. Uh, is there any sort of pattern or rhyme or reason around it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the naming convention is basically the name of the star and then a letter for the planet. And you might have noticed something missing. And the, the first planet that you find around a star is the B. So where's the A? The A is the star is really what it is. Um, and then the uppercase and the lowercase, right now, the way that we do it is that the uppercase is, um, can be a stellar companion even. And so if you have two um, stars in a system, like Alpha Centauri, for example, is a multiple star system. So we have Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B, and they're both capital letters because they're both um, higher than planetary mass. And we use the lowercase letter for planetary mass objects. Sometimes we don't know the mass, and so we actually have to change what letter we use. And it makes things kind of interesting, because the, the exoplanet that possibly exists around Alpha Centauri B is actually Alpha Centauri Big B Little B, because it's around the secondary in the stellar system, and then it's the, the first planet around that star. So that's kind of fun. Um, and then the stars' names, there's tons of different ways for measuring stars, and so I don't, won't go into that. Sometimes they're you know, fun because they're visible in the night sky, and so they're named after the constellation, like Alpha Centauri or uh, Kappa Andromeda. Sometimes they're from some kind of catalog, and so there's this license plate of indecipherable letters and numbers. <laughs> Any other questions for Emily? Uh, yeah, Mike. Front. I don't know if Michael's been up here yet, but he does videos, and that's why we're working on an exoplanet video together. Yeah. Michael's um, doing it, and I'm trying to make him do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was curious about the, uh, the transit. Um, when you're measuring uh, the, the transit, how long does that take to interpret the data? Like, is it days, months? Oh, minutes? yeah. It's, it depends on the data, and it kind of can take as long as you want. Um, so the Kepler mission in particular um, took, in the original version of the Kepler mission, it, it took data for about four years, um, and w scientists are still working on processing that data. And, that, and the Kepler mission, let's see, it was launched in uh, 2009? Now I can't remember. 2009? And so it took data from 2009 until 2013. Some of the first exciting results came out in 2011, but there's still tons of, tons of um, results coming out of even those first four years of data. Um, and so, and then there's the new Kepler mission. They didn't call it zombie Kepler officially. They call it K2 um, because well, the reaction wheels died and so it couldn't point as precisely as it used to be able to, but now they're pointing it in the plane of the solar system and using actually the um, radiation from the sun in order to stabilize it, which is super exciting. And so that is ongoing, and that'll also have more planets that are coming out of it. Um, but yeah, it varies for, you know, there's uh, a lot of data analysis that has to be done and a lot of follow-up observations in order to, to rule out false positives, especially for the transiting exoplanets. Cool. Okay. But you got a follow-up? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. 
But he needs a mic, doesn't he, in order to be online? Mic, but we also got to get moving. So. Um, so with the visualizations, uh, was there ever a visualization that was just so wrong or so inaccurate that you had to like get it taken down immediately? Oh, I, w I wish that were my job. I wish I were like the visualization police or something like that. And the answer is, is not really, you know, and I should, as much as I tease that like these aren't what they look like, like of course these aren't what they look like. And, and most of the people that do this work do really, really good jobs of um, you know, taking what we actually know about the planet, really, really using that in the visualization, and maybe using a little bit of, um, uh, of, of artistic license in order to fill it in. Otherwise, things would be just like, you know, empty spheres or something like that, and that would be kind of boring. Um, is there a really bad one? I can't think of a really bad one right now. Hmm. I'll find it. That'll be a different talk, I think. Good challenge. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Let's thank, let's thank Emily again. That was a great thank talk. Thank you.